Hello everybody, I'm Emma, I work in the tastings team and I'm joined today by my colleagues Anna and Catherine who will be doing all the technical behind the scenes sort of stuff. So welcome tonight to this very special Zoom webinar with Bodegas Vinert. So tonight we've got Iduna Vinert, who many of you will have already have met her virtually because she did a history of Bodegas Vinert with us way back at the end of June, which feels like a lifetime ago now. Her presentation, which can be found on the Society's YouTube channel, went down so well that we've asked her to come back and gladly Iduna agreed. Tonight, we're also delighted to have Hubert Weber, who's the winemaker at Videgas Vinert, and of course, the Society's buyer for Chile, Toby Morrill. The theme for this evening is a little bit different to those we've done in the past, as together, Toby, Hubert and Iduna will be tasting through three of Vinert's red wines, They'll be discussing where the grapes are grown, how the wines are made, and how this affects the final results in the glass in front of you. I think it's going to be a really interesting event, and I really hope that you all enjoy it as well. So as always, just a couple of points for housekeeping before we get started. So you'll all be on mute for the duration of the webinar. This is to ensure that there's no background noise. With the format of tonight's event, we would suggest that you set your screen to gallery view so you can see Iduna, Hubert and Toby at the same time, but you can flick backwards and forwards between gallery and, um, and full scale view as well. Um, we'll be taking questions in the second half of the event, so please use the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen if you'd like to ask any questions. And if you fancy it, as always, please do use the chat function to tell us where you are and what you're drinking. Um, do remember to post your comments to all panelists and attendees if you want everybody to see what you're writing. If you want to concentrate on the presentation and want to disable the chat function, I'm sure you all know this by now, click or tap on the three dots next to the chat, then on the bell button, and then click on disable notifications. So we're hoping that there's going to be plenty of time and a decent enough internet connection for you to ask your questions directly. If so, I'll call your name and I'll ask you to speak at that point. So I think that's all from me. I'll now pass you over to Toby. Thank you very much. Oops, Toby, you're on mute. You need to unmute yourself. There we go. Hello, sorry about that, I muted myself. Um, perhaps you'd be rather glad of that. Um, but um, here we are with uh, Iduna, and uh, you haven't met Hubert, Hubert Weber before, but I think Hubert um, uh, adds a certain Swiss precision and brilliance um, to the Argentine passion of, of Iduna, and I think uh, they work very well as a team. And um, he's Hubert also is a great sort of mushroom hunter. Um, he's I think he's come from Italian Switzerland also. Uh, he's a great cook, um, and he's a marvelous blender of wines. Um, so um, you know we're delighted to be here with us. I think the plan is that um, uh, Iduna is going to give a brief slideshow, um, just recapping about um, Weinert, and uh, then we're going to taste, and then Hubert is going to tell a little bit about his story, and then we're going to taste some wines, and then we're going to take questions afterwards. So uh, I, time is normally short in these things, so I'm going to hand over to Aduna now. Thank you very much, Toby, and hello to everyone. It's such a pleasure to be back online in this virtual tasting. Um, I'm very, very flattered that I was asked um, by Emma and Toby to do a second um, taste along. Um, and it is such a pleasure to introduce Hubert. Um, I'm going to have a very, very brief presentation um, about Vinet um, before we carry on into the wines. Um, as Today, the big star is Hubert and of course our wines as well. So this year for us is a very special year. We're 45 years, um, 45 years old. Um, so since 1975, Bodegas Vinet was established by my father, who is a Brazilian businessman, 
Um, my father's from the south of Brazil, and the three wines that we're going to taste today are three of the very classic wines and three of the very first wines that we produced back in 1977, which was our first vintage um, produced at Vineyard. So as most of you have seen either on Instagram or Facebook or in our last um, Zoom event, this is the beautiful um, winery that we have the honor to, to work at. This winery was built in 1890 by a Spanish family called Otero, and it was disactivated at about the 1950s. Um, it's a very beautiful colonial building with brick walls and very big deep cellars. Um, and my father basically um, fell in love with this building in the early 70s and in 1975 decided to um, buy this building, reconvert and rebuild um, the winery into a winery focused in high quality wines. Um, through his first business, which was international transport, he had all the commercial contacts to export wines. Um, so Vinod has always been a very international driven, let's put it that way, um, brand where we have always seen uh, or try to position our wines both internationally as domestically as well, following a very classic school of winemaking. So this is my dad. Um, my father is now 88 years old, um, holding our Malbec 1977. So this is our first vintage and also our first 100% Malbec, which at that point in the late 70s was something very unusual for Argentina. Um, Malbec was a blending grape, very tannic, a lot of structure and a lot of color, but it wasn't considered to be the noble grape. Um, and when my father came to Argentina and started the, the adventure Vinet, he paired with Don Raul de la Mota, who is the gentleman on the left. So Don Raul left us passed away in 2009, but he is considered to this day one of the most important, if not the most important winemaker um, from Argentina in the sense that he, has, he was a very huge, um, he was very passionate about Malbec. Um, and he really thought that Malbec had the potential to produce a high quality wine and be a flagship grape for Argentina. So he was the one in 1977 to say to my father and convince him and say, we need to do a 100% varietal of this grape. And it has a huge potential, not only as a varietal as or, and also as a blend as well. Um, and was the one to start with the Vineyard style, right? The Vineyard school um, here in Argentina. So Don Raul was our winemaker from 1977 until 1996. And this is where the story for today begins. Um, so Hubert in Switzerland as a very young winemaker and as a student um, of um, wine and enological engineering, as he likes to put it, had the opportunity to taste one of our wines, the Cava's Divine at 1985. And this was back in the beginning of the 90s, if I'm not mistaken, in 1992. So he fell in love with Vinod. He thought it was very different for, from what he was tasting from Argentina and managed to come to Argentina and settle a one-year practice. So January of 1996, and I remember this day very, very well, I was 14 at the time. Hubert comes to Mendoza. Um, it was very warm, very hot. It's very hot in Mendoza in our summer. And Hubert spoke five languages. It was English, French, German, Italian, and Swiss dialect. Imagine that for somebody who is a, who's about to go into a practice with Spanish speaking people. So I remember my dad saying, go to the office, speak to this guy, because he, he, nobody understands him and he cannot understand anyone, but you speak English. So please go there because you know, he's gonna come for one year with us. So this is how Hubert gets to Mendoza. Um, well, you'll see that now, nowadays he's more Argentine um, than anyone else in Argentina, although he doesn't like to say that. Um, but without further ado, I'm going to let Hubert speak about himself and tell us his story as to how he came for one year practice in 1996. And since 97, he is our first winemaker and as of today, obviously, is with Weinert. Hi, Hubert. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Nice to meet you. 
Thanks for the introduction, Iduna. <laughs> well, the Carlos Mine, as you said, Carlos Mine in 1985 brought me to the winery, thinking it was meant to be for a year. And well, it's almost 25 years in January. So uh, nice time here, yes. There are a lot of good things in Argentina, so I enjoy them, but I also maintain certain Swiss things. So the combination is very good. <laughs> Okay, I don't know um, where we want to go in the um, in the area of the wines where we are situated in the with the winery is uh, the reason why this winery was selected is not only the, the fantastic building but also the place uh, we are surrounded uh, with fantastic old vineyards, especially from old Malbecs up to 100 or even 110 year old Malbec vineyards. And one of the important points also, um, all wine wines are made with ungrafted uh, wines. So this is area is fantastic because it's possible to maintain this uh, philosophy because of soil, climate, etc. And to have the vineyards nearby the winery, which is also an uh, important point. Well, there, there are a lot of uh, small areas. The whole area is called Lujan de Cuyo. And we also uh, buy grapes from a, a little part from what is called Maipu, which you can see in the other part, in the higher part, it's called Russell, where uh, it's politically another place, but soil, climate, and vineyards, and management of the vineyards is, is uh, very similar than the central part of Lujan de Cujo, where we get uh, the basic uh, old Malbec grapes. And for Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, I go a little bit more south, crossing the river of Mendoza River, where we have a little bit uh, less silty soils, more sandy, stony soils. And uh, especially also uh, all the plantings of Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot in parallel system, which I like very much. We can go on uh, further on this in, when we taste uh, or talk about the different wines. But uh, it is very interesting point to have Cap and Merlot in, in Pergola system, Parral, how we call them here. So, um, well, this is the interesting point. Um, Bodega Winery has at the moment uh, no own vineyards, uh, but we have two over 100 year old Malbec vineyards we rent and work with. All the rest of the grapes are provided by small producers uh, from two, three, four, five hectares. Uh, the biggest one is 20 hectares. Uh, we get some of the grapes, not all of them. Uh, we just pick what we really need uh, for the winemaking of the year, depending on the climate, the, the, the uh, commercial need, or we want to say, okay, we want to make uh, a point on a little bit higher volumes on our high qualities, if the condition of the climate is good. Also learning and knowing other wine yards is always a process over a stock of less or more 50 great producers we are working with uh, since a lot of years. Um, some of them more years than I am at the winery. So a very good relation with these small producers which is uh, also very interesting uh, for them to have a great someone who's paying, buying the grapes every, every year. And as I said, they're all very, um, especially Malbec, old vineyards, they're very stable in production and quality. So the most important part is to see the differences of the year, how they react. And then in the winemaking process to select the wines which are going in which line of quality. Well, harvested um, in small boxes, 20 kilograms or the beans, 600 kilograms. Very classical winemaking process, um, very border oriented in terms of harvesting point, uh, the ripening of the seeds, uh, sugar levels, acidity levels, uh, health, healthiness and state of the, of the plant. Uh, it's very border oriented, uh, which is very contracting and very interesting to, to see that the, the handling in the winery of the wine is Italian. We don't make a French pressing system, we do Italian, uh, de um, and then the aging process, depending on the wine, between one, two, three, or 
the maximum wine, if you had the opportunity to buy a ball, was the Tonel or Cask uh, 111, which the wine was 23 years aging in one of the casks. So um, aging process is very important, but it is also very important uh, in the process to see what's happening with these, these wines and the selecting process. We are very strict on selecting, which starts uh, on the different on the different levels and to see and if we are not happy with the quality of a year for doing some wine, we jump the year. This is why, we, why you may not get Galas, for example, every year. Uh, some years we do, some years we don't know because we're not happy with uh, the combination of the three grape varieties. So uh, selecting is a very important part of Bodega Wine and philosophy. Well, you can see the, in the picture some, some casks and the uh, maintenance of the cask uh, is also very important, not only inside, shaving out uh, the tartarics um, if necessary, but also during the year, outside cleaning of the cask, uh, cleaning the cask when the wine is going out and re before refilling. There's quite a lot of work to be done on this, uh, these casks with uh, average age over 50 years. The oldest is one over 100 year old, still a fantastic cask. Now and then there are, there are different sizes. We have cask. The smallest one is 1,200 liter, and the biggest one is 44,000 liters. And the biggest uh, volume is the one you can see Duna and uh, Don Bernardo and her brother Andre. Uh, on the down part, the 6,000 liter casks and the 4,000, 4,500 liter casks on top. This is the biggest collection of casks in quantity, um, but there are also different forms and shapes, oval ones, round ones. So uh, each cask makes different wine and after then it's uh, interesting to have a lot of, I say, a lot of cards where I can play together the different plants, plants for the different qualities. Yeah. Robert, if I may ask you a question, um, we have well 260 casks in our cellars. Um, how often do you taste all of the wines? Is it once a year? How And how many different vintages do we have aging at the same time? I think these curiosities of Viner does something that um, are very, very cool to speak about. As you as a winemaker to take care of 260 different casks, um, how, how, do you, how do you plan the blends and how, how are wines aging? What is the difference between wine aging in a cask and in a barrel? Okay, there are a lot of questions. <laughs> uh, tasting, uh, do um, one general tasting, uh, we try to do normally between August and September uh, in a short time to taste all the 260 casks in maximum one month. And then during the year, uh, if, if I am working on blends or studies or I have time to read pass, then I say, okay, now I want to taste Malbecs from this year to this year to see how they evolve, to um, make pre-decisions on possible blends to come, uh, like orientation. And then if I want to do really a blend, I say, okay, I concentrate on this year. I want to taste all Malbecs from only this year or caps, or if uh, they're Carascal or Malcalas blends, then I have all the three different varieties. So. It depends a little bit uh, the point. So an average between uh, objective tastings, general tastings, and uh, laboratory analysis when the lab guy says, uh, who will come and taste this? Or so minimum twice a year I have to all the casks tasted. Yeah. Um, then you had a question. What was the other question? Sorry. <laughs> It was something about, I think in, about in that line. <laughs> Toby? I think, Are we? Was asking about, I think Aduna was asking about the size of the casks and how they vary. I mean, I think we were astonished, weren't we, when we tasted the 23-year-old the Malbec, the Tonel 111, um, that although it was very mature, very interesting things happen with the evaporation in your cellar, don't you? Because you seem to get, um, you lose water 
but you concentrate the other elements. So, in fact, um, wine is a very curious mix of something with aspects of age, but also the acidity, imp the acidity improves, doesn't it? And the alcohol r rises. So, in a sense, it's, it's fresher than one might expect. Is that, is that something you, mm -hmm. you feel? Yeah, definitive. Um, the, the, as you say, the evaporation in, in whiskey and spirits, you always say about the angel share. In the wine cellar, the angels are drinking water <laughs> because it's water that's evaporating. So we have a certain concentration of sugars, alcohols, tannins, um, who give certain more, uh, more uh, concentration. And also uh, the inflation influence on, on the wine itself. Uh, the oldest part of the wines is in general the, the color. Nose is fresher and the most fresh part of the wine is the taste, mm -hmm. uh, which is, as you said, the, 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 um, the acidity who helps to, with the concentration to maintain fresh and fruity the wines, especially in the mouth. Which is very interesting. And what is from the difference the between, and how do the casts vary, the, the bigger ones and the smaller ones? Obviously, you have more surface area in the smaller ones. Do you get a little bit more oxygen there? Does the, do the flavors develop slightly faster in a smaller cask? Yes, in theory, in theory, yes, but it's not like to do that. It depends a lot where the cask is placed in the cellar because we have uh, air flows through the cellar at certain parts where, which are more in a wind still place. And it depends if they're in the down part or the open part, uh, depends how um, thick the, the cask, uh, the wall is of, the, of the, wooden, the wooden part, the quality of the part. So each cask is different in different places. This is also the reason uh, why I don't have classifications by grape varieties. Um, wines are made single vineyard wines as much as possible and are also going for single uh, vineyard aging in the casks. And each cask is different, reacting on the different wines also. Um, it's not that you can say it's, it's, it should be like that, but there are a lot of other factors uh, who influence on, on, the, on the, the reaction of uh, what we say in general, it should be so, but it's much more complex than that. Yeah, and I mean, this that's, is also... That's fascinating how there is this variation. Just going back to one thing you said, you said that the, the, the casts that have more airflow react differently. How, how does that change yeah. the, the, the flavor profile if you have a cask that's in... Um, in, in an area where there's quite a lot of airflow compared to one that's in a stiller air. If you have a little more airflow, then you also have, in Mendoza, we have general uh, dry air. So we have a little bit more uh, evaporation, a little bit more concentration. Cotonel um, Unico Cabernet Sauvignon, cask 120, you will get, or you have already tasted it. Um, is one of the quite exposed casks. And it's interesting to see also the difference, how a Malbec evolves in a cask like this and the Cabernet Sauvignon. In this term, in a smaller cask, on a more free air flow, uh, I prefer more caps and the more lows to have. And the Malbecs, I prefer to have more in areas which I have a little bit less air flow in the cellar. Uh, to preserve a little more the other tannins and um, a little bit more plummy flavors. They are a little bit more sensitive than the Cabernet Sauvignon flavors, for example. But uh, well, every wine, every year is a little bit different. These are general ideas and observations, but uh, exceptions are confirming the rules. So trying to maintain yeah, a lot. Lots of exceptions. It sounds really fascinating. And you probably yes, surprised yourself sometimes. <laughs> by that. There was one other question that I think Aduna raised, which is interesting. How many different vintages do you have um, in the cellar at any one time, roughly? I mean, it must vary, but 
at the moment, for example? Uh, um, actually, uh, we have the oldest one in the cask at the moment is 2004. Uh, then I have a cask of cap, 2005. Several Malbecs, 06, then 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 is gone, 12 is gone, 13 is a lot of wine still, 14 a little bit, 15 a little bit, 16, I think there is one cask only, um, 17 also very few, 18 a little bit, 19 now a lot, and 20, we're just filling the cask at the moment, so there are a lot of Nice cask, yeah. <laughs> so it lots is, of harvest. Yeah, I mean, it's so fascinating that because I think um, any bodega starting up today <laughs> would not be able to have 10 vintages or 12 vintages, whatever you, it was, in the cellar because the cash flow would, their accountant would allow it. But once you've started and you have that wonderful wine sort of in the bank, um, you can produce these wonderful flavors, I think, which, you know, I think sometimes we've said there's, there's um, a similarity between some old old Grand Reserva Riocas or Chateau Moussa, um, but these lovely, mature, leathery, tertiary aromas, tobacco, leather, cedar, um, which come from the long aging. And, and I think those flavors are so interesting where, you know, time is money and people are trying to churn out wines really quite quickly to get their cash flow. Uh, and you still have this wonderful uh, bank of old wines. And uh, I think it's so much part of your character and it's, uh, and it's absolutely fascinating um, to hear you speak about how they, how they vary. And I think it's one, one great element um, of the wine art style. Um, Wonderful, mm -hmm. thank you so much for that. Do you think Excellent. we should so possibly... Just... Go on, yeah. As I was going to say, exactly the same thing, Toby. I think if you want to start going through the tasting, um, I'm hoping members have been sipping while they've been listening to you, otherwise they'll be getting very thirsty indeed. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's, it's 7.30. Maybe we can speak, we can spend 10 minutes or so tasting the three wines and Hubert, perhaps you could lead the discussion. And then that'll leave a little bit of time for questions afterwards. I'm sure, I'm sure the lines are, the lines are hot. Um, so perhaps Hubert, you could, you could talk us through the, the Carascal um, Corte Classico 17. Okay. Well, uh, as you can see in the uh, info sheet, it's a uh, blend based uh, 40 pack. Uh, Malbec uh, grapes or vineyards, I generally basically select for thinking in they will go in Carascal are at least 35, 40 year old vineyards, uh, all ungrafted, as I said before. Traditional uh, high density plantings, five and a half, six thousand plants per hectare. Uh, sorry. Carry on, I think, Hubert. I think we're just listening to you. Yeah, carry on. Good. Okay, you, I go on with the... Uh, yes, I think so. Carry on. It's very, very interesting to hear what you're saying. Okay, uh, I go on with the explanation. I didn't hear you very well. I go with the explanations or you want to go on the tasting directly of the wine? I think it would be interesting. Can you hear me, Huber? No. I can hear you with uh, small interruptions. Right. I think one thing that would be interesting would be for you to explain what the Malbec brings to the blend, what the Merlot brings to the blend, and what the Cabernet Sauvignon brings to the blend. 
Okay, uh, the Malbec to this blend brings uh, the plummy, the softness, the velvety round tannins, while Cabernet Sauvignon brings more the acidity, red fruits, also with more low red fruits, a little bit more the structural, the bone part, uh, while the Malbec brings more the, the meat uh, to, the, to the wine. Um, very interesting also uh, being a blend and especially with a blend with Malbec in 40% is very temperature sensitive. This is something, a question I heard before was coming up. Uh, Carrascal is very uh, varied uh, in reaction how he presents himself depending on the temperature. If you go with a little bit cooler temperature, boy 15, 16, 17 degrees, uh, you will have more information on, for your taste on Cabernet Sauvignon and Merlot. And when you go up with the temperature, 17, 18, 19, or even 20, Malbec will come more and more in presence for the tasting sensations. So it depends a lot uh, the food you have or if you want to drink it for uh, the food or after the food. After food is a bit better. Uh, warmer when you have a little bit more Malbec sweetness with the food, a bit cooler, then you have a bit more the Cabernet Sauvignon tannins playing with the fat from, from the meat or, or the tannin, the, the, the freshness, the herbal part. So uh, it's very flexible to go and for this reason also a wine is very flexible to go with a lot of different foods. Uh, we have really made a um, very crazy experience sometimes with uh, seafood and uh, fish and sea, uh, sea fish and uh, other fish and uh, different uh, animals from well <laughs> the normal ones uh, cow and um, pork whatever and, and it is very flexible it's fantastic wine to go it's not complicated opening fast so really nice wine to go and a lot of different flavors coming up and presenting wine Lovely. Thanks very much for explaining that. Um, it, there is a question on the Carrascal, which I think is, is interesting also to, to introduce in here, in that what is the aging potential of the Carrascal? So it is the youngest wine that we have right now. Our youngest release is 2017, so that's three years old, with two years in the casks, of aging in the casks. Um, and is it meant to be drunk right now like ready to drink and not sell it um how much aging potential do you um suggest and, um so i think in terms of the drinking window which i know that all the wine society fans are very um thoughtful about could you lead us through how much more time people should sell this one want to sell it uh, Carrascal, uh, based on, on Malbec, uh, with the DM Cork, who is going for the Wine Society, has at least uh, five years uh, basic aging in uh, normal cellars, with not very stable, like a house place where you can store the wine. If you have a good place with a cooler temperature, stable humidity, um, 10 years. If you have a good year, um, like 17 was, for example, uh, I would say you can maintain, if you have the possibility to maintain uh, 10 years or even more. Uh, the oldest color skull we have is 2000, uh, 2000, <laughs> 1978. It's still fantastic. Um, obviously, with the aging process, the Molo is the one who ages fastest, and the Cabernet and the Malbec is the one who most preserves the wine in the time. So the older the Carrascal uh, goes, the more the Malbec tastes are coming over. So the, the, the tannins of the cap are disappearing and the Malbec tannins are taking over, just more plummy and the sweeter he goes, when the older he goes. So um, if you like this style of older, soft and mellow wines, then no problem to age 10 years or more. Great. Would you talk us through, or perhaps we should just move on because time is, time is carrying on. Perhaps you talk to us a little bit about the, um, the Vinert Cabernet 2008. 
the Cabernet Sauvignon. Well, as I mentioned very shortly before, uh, I like very much Cabernet Sauvignon from Paral um, Conducted Wine Yards. Uh, this one is coming from an area called Ugateche, as a 90% less or more. Uh, it's a two uh, wine yard uh, blend only. Um, Uber, sorry to the, interrupt. The sorry to interrupt, but just maybe you can just explain Paral, or perhaps I can just. Basically, it's like a pergola, isn't it? And so you have a roof. Yes. And the grapes hang yeah. down in dapple shade, mm -hmm. so they're protected from sunburning and excessive um, solar solar radiation, if you like. And they're sort of protected, aren't they, in this nice climate under the under the parasol of, of leaves. And it's a way of protecting grapes in, in really quite warm climates, isn't it? A bit like the Envaso, the Gobley, uh, training system in the south of France or very hot areas where the grapes hang below the leaves. Correctly. So, and they have the protection of the acidity, of the freshness, a, a longer uh, ripening term because uh, sugar accumulation is not as fast as it would be uh, with more sun exposure. So this also helps to have uh, round and soft cabinet tannins and uh, well-balanced uh, general ripening process for the berries and uh, something I like very much I want to find always in the Cabernet Sauvignons in the wines is the, the fruit sweetness from the Cabernet Sauvignon grapes. Cabernet Sauvignon berries they have sugar obviously but there is also a fruit sweetness and I love to find this also after the aging process in the cask between the tannins and the acidity and the oak flavors to find this fruit sweetness, which is fantastic for, for going, especially with uh, barbecued uh, meat, uh, obviously with other foods too, but especially with uh, barbecue meat. Uh, this is fantastic wine to go with, with this sweetness and spices when you can spice and the, the, the smoke of the grilled meat. It's a fantastic combination. And this wine was in, in cask for 10 years. Is that, is that so? Yes, um, the minimum, theoretical minimum is five years, but uh, well, sometimes it happens that it's a little bit more. I hope you're not worried about it. <laughs> not worried, absolutely delighted. I think it's uh, fantastic okay. <laughs> wine and cars for so long. And um, mm -hmm. as Aduna says, many people like to know how long you keep this wine. It's delicious now, isn't it? It's mellow, it's leathery, it's cedary, um, yeah. it's nicely balanced, but it will carry on maturing very well. How long would you say you could keep it for? Um, the other day, uh, we opened a bottle of Cabernet Sauvignon 1997, which was my first year as wine maker here. So um, over 20 years, so it's very young, this one. Too young. <laughs> well, don't, don't, don't tell people to keep it too long, or we won't sell any more wines. <laughs> They'll all be keeping. It. <laughs> they have to buy it to sell it in their homes. Yeah. <laughs> Let's. Um, sorry to rush you, but I think we should. Um, we should. Uh, look at the the which is okay. one of your top wines, isn't it? I mean, it's it's always made from the best vintages and is a sort of super wine, I think. Tell us a bit more about the, the, the 09 Cavas. The 09 Cavas is also a lot of years in cask. Uh, this one is, um, if, you, if you have tasted it, it has a quite uh, intense oak flavor, a little bit more than other years. Um, it's very, it was a more 2,000 liter cask than 6,000 liter casks. Especially also from this era we talked before, uh, where the air is going to the cellar, and we have the Cabernet really fantastic um, aged in this part, while the Malbec is from over 90 year old wine yards, Malbec wine yards, which gives this really plummy, concentrated, elegant, and velvety cinnamon flavors. 
And uh, the Merlot is still very present here. This is a Merlot from an area uh, here in Drummond, uh, also in Paral, a very, very old Merlot clone, originally from Bordeaux, who gives um, almost a honey flavor taste on the, on the Merlot berries, which also is coming over in the wine. And I love to have the combination. Well, as you know, Gauss the wine brought me to the winery <laughs> from Switzerland. And I really love the combination on this level of these uh, three grape varieties uh, for drinking alone or with some uh, little bit more elegant food, uh, filet, steaks, and something like that. Uh, it's, a, it's a great wine. Just it's absolutely wonderful. 2009 has a very high capacity of aging. If you see the color, it's still very alive. So um, normally I don't like to opening the bowls too much time before drinking. But uh, this one uh, really serves you a little bit, so you have a little bit more air in the bowl. So 10, 15 minutes is good uh, today um, because it's quite young to, to open a little bit more the the characters and the, the balance. And don't drink it too cold. Uh, better 17, 18 than uh, 15, 16. Malbec is a very important part of this blend. And the Cabernet Sauvignon and the Merlot are strong enough to support a little bit higher temperatures also. So don't go too cold on, on this wine. It's an astonishing uh, wine for me because you have elements of maturity, but it's so juicy, isn't it? You know, you say, Ugoso, there's a yeah. lovely richness and velvetiness and roundness on the palate. It's not drying out at all. Um, you know, it's in fantastic form, and you have almost the, the richness on the palate of a young wine and the, um, the aroma development of an older wine. Uh, and it's sort of miraculous, I think, that it's so round and juicy, and yet it has this lovely elements of cedar, tobacco, so forth. So I think it's, it's, it's a wonderful wine. Thank you so much. And this was 10 years in cask, wasn't it? Oh, so, yeah. <laughs> I add a romantic note to the Calvas de Vinet. Um, and this is something that I absolutely adore, and I always um, suggest uh, to have the whole Vinet experience, to listen to the Moldau. Moldau is a symphonic poem by Smetana. Um, and this is the music that when Hubert is getting inspired to make the blend of the Calvas, it's like the, the music pairing for the Calvas is this symphonic poem, The Moldau. I'll send you my email afterwards. There's this beautiful, one beautiful piece, um, which is the river Moldau from the Bohemian forest, its flow um, into Prague. So I always find it very interesting, um, you know, to, to taste the wine with the music that Hubert actually listened to <laughs> all the new blends. So that's, that's kind of my romantic note, you know, that I'm always into the romance of wine. Of wine. Yes, and there is, there is sort of a musical analogy, isn't there? And the way the wine is constructed, because you have, uh, you know, you, you, have, you have tenors, you have... Um, altos, you have basses, you have uh, great rhythm. Um, there is something sort of um, musical in, in the way that the different, the different voices of the great varieties contribute to a wonderfully harmonious effect. Absolutely, and especially when you see the wine opening up you know, in the glass and as you taste through the bottle, it's also very interesting, as you say, you know, the, it, it's like a symphony. It starts, um, it might start loud or low, but it, it actually builds up and it is a story. Um, and with the wine, it's the same thing. It is a whole story of these three great varieties in their own particular uh, moment um, and how they play along with each other. So it's really interesting. Um, you know, to match wine and music. And this is one thing that I've always loved um, from Hubert as, a, as a, a blender. I think his, his, 
his greatest um, ability as a winemaking is, you know, his ability to blend from many different casks, different wines, different regions, all these different single vineyards to make something very balanced um, and, and very, very round, put it that way. Um, so it is a kind of a, a symphony by its own. I think it's, it's, it's quite interesting that each one, each, each of our wines have their own music as well, have their own blending music. Um, so it has all to do with the purpose of the wine um, that we're producing. There is no question that Hubert is a maestro of uh, blending. I see Emma uh, is popping up, but it's probably Hello. time for questions, is it? I popped back in and again, I was just thinking actually we should get all the members to write in and say what music they most associate the different wines of um, Vinat with. So um, I think we could get some interesting responses there. But um, you're right, we have had so many questions come in. Um, would you mind if we started on them? Is that okay? Fantastic. Sure. In which case, the first question is from Peter Ford. Peter, are you there? Yep. Hello, uh, hello from Bergen. Um, I'm with from um, my family home about a mile from Chasse. But um, 30 years ago, we lived in Argentina, my wife and I, uh, we young journalists, and we discovered and enjoyed Cabas de Vernat wines very much indeed. And Carrascal, because of the ridiculous economic situation in 1989 in Argentina, um, we could buy wines for absurdly low prices and Carrascal was our daily wine. And we used to drink Cabas de Vernat, if I remember rightly as well. Um, and I just wonder, we were delighted to discover this wine again for the first time in 30 years on the Wine Society's list. Um, I joined the Wine Society earlier this year. And the question is, what, if anything, has changed over the last 30 years in the way you make the Carrascal? Hubert, would you like to um, tell a little bit about how you changed, especially the cleaning of the cask since 97? I think that's one thing that is quite interesting. Yes. Uh, well, uh, biggest change has been uh, starting in the wine yard. There has been a little bit more work on uh, selecting wine yards with more objective. Uh, going for Carrascal sometimes had uh, wine yards which are a little bit too old. So uh, searching for wine yards which are more balanced for Carrascal. Then uh, there was, a, as Iduna said, was a lot of work. We started 2003 for all wines in the more um, deeper cleaning process inside the casks, uh, protecting them because the older the cask, the more sensitive it is on uh, retinomyces to take care that uh, these flavors don't uh, take over uh, the rest of the fruity, the freshness, etc. Um, there were changing in the, the bottling line. There were still changes uh, on the corks. Uh, we had, uh, when you drank drunk the Carrascal, if you remember, there were natural corks, then we changed, but we had quite a lot of problems. Uh, then we changed to synthetic corks, then we taste to another cork. And today we're using Diam, which is a really nice experience to see uh, the evolution, especially in the first half year. Uh, how the wine maintains uh, really the, the characteristics um, from when we pause the wine that you have more enjoyable flavors uh, from the Carrascal. So in general, I would say over these 30 years um, in the blend, there's been a little, maybe a little change from a bit a more mild cabinet dominated Carrascal in the past. Today it's very stable on 40, 35, 25 since 2004 actually uh, can maintain this uh, blend proportions. And in general, I think you will have a Carrascal compared with 30 years ago with a little bit fresher and opener, uh, resuming the, your question. Yeah, I think I think that in what, what we've done, and especially since Hubert took over, without changing the style of our wines, we have focused a lot on improving the quality of our wines. Right, so fresher fruit, brighter fruit, cleaner fruit, 
um, as well through all you know that the Hubert says, but stylistically wise, um, we believe and we want to keep you know the same style. We think there is a very very interesting. Um, there's an interesting point to be so different, basically, from, from Argentina. So we like to have kind of our own personality and our own style, but that does not mean that we're not trying to always improve the quality of our wines. Um, so that's kind of yeah, where we are. With all that work, you probably got more consistency. So each bottle um, tastes um, as good as it should do. Um, Hubert mentioned Brettanomyces, should maybe just, if people don't know what that is, it's actually yeast which gives um, a sort of horsey flavor, uh, a bit of farmyard flavor um, to wines. And it was very common many years ago. And I think um, um, perhaps Hubert can comment, but I think a, lit a, a little bit is nice, but too much dominates a wine and makes all wines taste the same of Brettanomyces. So I think Huber, you're, you're, you're reducing that character. Is that right? Huber, you're, um, you're on mute. You need to unmute yourself. Yeah. Perfect. Now it's good. Okay. Uh, well, uh, if you are working uh, working with uh, casks with old wood, uh, Brettanomyces will be always present. The point is to maintain it in levels which you can feel more on the flower side than on the horse and leathery tobacco side. Uh, there has to be a balance. Some certain wines are more sensitive, and other ones are a bit more tolerant. So, uh, but it's very important to, to have a, very, a lot of work done on this to, to maintain it controlled, because if you lose the control, then it goes quite fast, not so tasty. Very much indeed. Uh, the wine is not the same as it was 30 years ago, but it's still delicious. Better. Thanks. <laughs> Okay, our next questions, um, actually I think we've just got two, have come in from Hannah Aldgate. Um, Hannah, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Excellent. Um, actually, um, continuing on the Brettanomyces theme, actually, sorry, this wasn't my original question, but I am intrigued. Uh, Hubert, how do you control the Brettanomyces? Is there anything in particular that you do to make sure that you get the right level of Brett? Yes. Uh, remember that Brettanomyces comes originally from the vineyards. And it is present as a natural uh, yeast in the vineyards, when some years more, some years less. So you have already uh, contamination coming with the grapes. So uh, very important is first to, to have clean uh, winemaking process, clean matchings, and the whole process during the winemaking has to be very clean. Uh, because once you get it in the wine and you get it in the cask, the, the Brettanomyces goes uh, several millimeters inside to the wood. So in the past, what uh, classically was done to conserve the, the oak cask was burning sulfur inside the cask to uh, eliminate Brettanomyces and other bacteria and yeasts. Uh, this is very good, but um, it works only in very, on the surface practically of the cask. Uh, so what we have done is uh, much more uh, studies on uh, other uh, ways to eliminate Brettanomyces in, in more inside of the, the wooden part. So after taking out the wine, cleaning it, uh, if necessary, to make a control on retinitis, the wine, the cask is uh, filled with acidified, with tartaric uh, acid, uh, acidified on low pH and uh, adding sulfite into the water for two, three, four days. So what's happening is that this acidified water with the sulfite penetrates these few millimeters inside the wood and we have a better control of reduction and reduction of retinomyces inside the, the wooden part. This is the, then we have to take it out of water, cleaning again the cast, drying out, and then again um, uh, 
putting in the wine. So this is uh, quite intense work. It has to be done in maximum uh, 10 days, but uh, the results have been really uh, very satisfying. Uh, we are we're expecting certain changes, but um, reducing bread is not only eliminating flavors, pretonomites, it's also is consuming a lot of structural, what we feel uh, in the taste, uh, sweet compounds, uh, not fermentable sugars for other yeasts. And uh, the wines are tasting um, fresher and, and also sweeter. There's more structure uh, eliminating pretonomites. Is this less or more? Fantastic. Hello. Okay, so our next question has come in. It's actually a bit of a blend of different questions. Um, it's the Cariscal Assemblage um, Especial is a blend of vintages, which seems a rare proposition for red wines. How did Vinet come to the decision to make this? And is it a blend of different Cariscal Corte Classic vintages or blend from individual Malbec Cabernet Sauvignon and Merlot barrels? Very bad reception. Can you repeat the question, please? What is I, I can definitely try. So I can break it down for you. So the Cariscal it's, um, why did you come to the decision to make such a blend of different vintages? This is on very the, rare this, thing sorry, to this, do. this is the Assemblage Especial. Yes, that's right. Which was, um, had many different vintages and it was there to celebrate your 40th anniversary, was it? Exactly, that was back in, nine, in 2017. And then, did you understand, Hubert? Do you want to talk through the, 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 the blending process of the Assemblage Especial? It's one of my favorite wines and my favorite projects, so. <laughs> You're on mute, Hubert. Again, okay. Hi, you can hear me? Okay. Yeah, it was a very nice project uh, for the 30th uh, birthday of production for uh, Bodega Winer to do something different, but within the philosophy of the winery. And a certain moment, uh, the idea came up to do something and was received first with a lot of mmms. And, um, <laughs> and then uh, just started to bring together certain wines and thinking about, and suddenly it was a lot of fun and was growing. And yeah, it was really very interesting uh, quite short-term project for Weinert. I think we made in a few months from zero to having the, the wine blended. That was quite interesting project. Yeah, I hope we can do it again. It was very good. But Huber, yeah. Huber, I, mean, I, think, Huber I think it's a fantastic success. I mean, when I first heard about it, I thought that the younger wines were really going to clash with the older wines. Right. But, you know, it's like a soprano and a bass. I mean, for me, it's fantastically well. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is down to you, the skill of your blending. Uh, yes. Um, it, if you had uh, used younger caps and molos in the blend, then I would agree that you have a domination of the younger ones and older. But in the young part, I mostly used Malbec. And also the oldest ones are Malbecs and the caps and Merlots are a bit more present in the middle field of age, uh, where they already have a little bit more balance, the tannins are a bit uh, softer, Merlot especially uh, without, without uh, the dominant green uh, ivy part in the middle. So um, this is the, the construction is very uh, the normal carascal is uh, important the malbec part but on this plan in the tasting part uh, was especially important the malbec uh, to avoid actually the situation you are mentioning for me it's a masterpiece it's like those wonderful 
Renaissance polyphonic masses, you know, uh, like Talis had Speminalium, which is a 40 part, I think it's a 40 part mass. So you have these amazing uh, different um, voices all producing wonderful harmony. And, you know, not not just not just a different not just a different uh, great varieties, but obviously the complexity increased with the different vintages. So uh, uh, it was your first time you've ever done this, hasn't it? And I think it's been a, been a great success. So uh, fantastic, well done, Huber. Brilliant. Excellent. Well, just um, again, an eye on the time, and um, as per usual, we have run out of time. Um, I do know, and Huber, are you happy if um, we email you the question questions that didn't get asked? Would you mind answering them later? Would that be okay? Absolutely, no problem. No pro I was expecting that because I knew we would run out of time again. It's just too much to talk about, but absolutely. Just send me um, your emails and whoever wants questions, specific questions about vine at any of our wines. Hubert or whatever will be happy to transfer them in the That's in the next awesome. couple of days. Well, thank you so much. I have to say it's been a really fascinating evening again. Um, the wines have been showing fantastically. I've actually been lucky enough to have the Carvers to Vine at um, the cast selection. So um, I've been quite happily sat sipping on that while listening to you guys talking. It's been a fabulous time. Um, we will wrap up now but we will try and collect together all the questions so those of you who are watching if you've got anything you really specifically would like to ask if you email tastings we'll pass it on to Idina and Huber um, later and we'll get the answers for you um, otherwise all that's left for me to say is thank you ever so much to all three of you for what has been an absolutely fascinating evening um, been a slightly different style this evening but I think it's gone down really well so and a lot of chat about music as well which has made quite a nice difference so thank you very much to all three of you it's been great thank you thank you and cheers to all of you <laughs> thank you thank you so much Emma thank you so much Toby and obviously thank you Hubert for taking your time and I'll see you next time <laughs> yeah definitely <laughs> thank you Thank you. Bye-bye.